If all goes well, people can, from home can hear me. We started a little later this morning working on some sounds and songs inside the newer all computer. Well, that's uh, that's interesting how there's that seconds a loop between what I say and what actually hits the internet. Um, but we're rolling, we're live. Here we are, and uh, I want to say howdy to Fred and Ray and Ann and Michael. Let's bring it up from Alabama. Uh, Janine, bring it up from Las Vegas. Uh, uh, Silver Springs being represented there. I mean, that's uh, an interesting collection of people, isn't it? Anyway, welcome to all of you, those who are here in presence and those online. Uh, we had a very busy week. I was doing a wedding which involved, was in Gardnerville, involved a Friday night practice, a Saturday. So Gwen is not singing today, which, you know, we still got Stan, strong, strong, strong work, Stan. And other than that, it should be a pretty regular service. Uh, let us begin. Good morning. If you're able, please stand with us, with me, I guess. Yeah. It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain It's the song of the forgiven Drowning out the Amazon rain Song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire Every tribe, every tongue, every nation Love song born of a grateful choir It's all God's children singing glory, glory Hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns It's all God's children singing glory, glory above the four winds caught up in the heavenly sound praises that go from the towers of cathedrals faithful gather underground of all the songs sung from dawn of creation some were meant to persist of all the bells rung from thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word it's all God's children saying glory glory hallelujah he reigns he reigns it's all God's children Sing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's children sing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, it's all God's children sing glory, glory, Have a seat. Morning, church. Morning. 
So good to see all of you this morning. I am the fill-in prayer person, as Andy's not here today. So um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you are great. You are awesome. You are worthy to be praised, Father. We know, God, that you control all things, and you are trustworthy, Lord. And so we humbly come before you, your children, and ask that you would remember those who are sick today, Lord, who are suffering with COVID, Lord. We pray, God, for those who are dealing with wildfires and recovering from hurricanes and so many things that have hit our country, God. But we know that you hold it all in your hands. And God, you are able. You are in control. It may not seem like it to us, God, but we know that we can fully trust in you with everything. Father, we just ask your Holy Spirit to fill this place, God. We ask you to fill our hearts, Lord. Renew us this day, God, that we might be more like you. And we will give you all praise, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can, please stand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now. I see so clearly Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away, washed away my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed Shining as the sun, we've no last days to sing your praise than when we first begun. Hallelujah, grace like rain. Stains are washed away, washed. 
washed away. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. All my stains are washed away. Standing in the sun Can only imagine Please have a seat. I apologize as I looked at the video from last week. I had mentioned beforehand my printer ink was dying and I had half printed letters in different colors and I said quite a few words I didn't mean to say and words, you know. Now, hopefully that won't happen today. If it does, I may need to be checked out for other things, but uh, hopefully that'll look a little bit better today. Uh, we continue on just looking at some different chapters in the Old Testament, looking at some different uh, portions of life in these Old Testament characters. Now, last week we talked about, who remembers? Uh-oh. Last week we talked about Daniel. Daniel. Remember, he wouldn't eat the food, or the king's food. Wouldn't talk about Daniel. Well, today I'd like to talk about his three friends. Now, most of the time you hear him referred to as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Those are their Babylonian or Chaldean names. But their Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Get right to it. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and set up on the plain of, set up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So it's a pretty simple sentence. It's saying the king set up this big, tall statue in the middle of the plain there. I think it's what all could see. It mentions that it was sixty cubits high and six cubits wide. That works out to about ninety feet tall and nine feet wide. It's a very long, narrow statue or idol, whatever this thing was, this image of gold. I will stop right there for a minute and explain a few things. There are people who read through the Bible, and they are only looking for mistakes or problems or things they don't understand so they can raise a fist and say, this doesn't make sense, the Bible's not real. Uh, this could be one of them, because someone could say, something made out of gold would never stand. It was 90 feet high and only 9 feet wide. The gold's a softer metal. It would never support it, you know. And to them, it's just another fallacy of the Bible. Well, I have several thoughts on that type of thinking. And on other, other verses like this that people have a problem with, it goes, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. A, the Bible's not really going to spend a lot of time talking about the statue itself. It's not going to talk about the intricate carvings or whose faces were on it or all these different things. Or was it depicting different battles throughout the Babylonian history? It doesn't mention any of that. Why? Because that's not the point. So when the guy said it was six cubits wide and 60 cubits high, did he whip out a tape measure before he said that? All right? I mean, if you ask me how big is that parking lot, I'll give you a good guess. You know, I'm sure it'll be close. Right? We don't know if the guy did that. We don't know if Daniel did that. Whoever, you know. Um, then it says it's gold. Does it say it's pure gold? A hundred percent gold. It doesn't say that. Right? And 
if it's not pure gold and somehow that doesn't make this statement true, I feel sorry for most people wearing jewelry because it's not pure gold either. You know, they got to mix in other metals to make it stronger. It's not pure gold. So what I'm talking about is just some possible understandings of the dimensions of this thing and how it could possibly stand. And everything I have just said is speculation and conjecture. Why? Because the words don't tell us much more and I wasn't there. Furthermore, this piece of this artifact has not survived the, the time in centuries, and you won't be able to find any bits or pieces of it. Probably because it was made out of gold. My guess is uh, it, it found its way into the hands of many. Everything I've just said about this is just speculation and possible things as to what this temp what held this, this image up. The only other point I want to make is, and if you don't like what I've said, you're also working on speculation and conjecture as to whether it could stand, whether it could fall. We don't have it laying around anymore. We weren't there, and the Bible doesn't say much more about it. Verse 2. He summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and if that wasn't enough, and all other uh, provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Verse 3, so, here we go again, the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. So again, this was going to be an impressive ordeal. This was going to be a, a, a majestic uh, landmark, a statue, of this idol. You know, and I mean, you build something like the Empire State Building, you know, people kind of stood around and watched that. That was pretty impressive at the time. You know, I can see that going on. Who all was invited? Just about everybody important from that list of things I just read. Every official, and my guess is that means governors, what we call governors and senators and other law officials and politicians and legal representatives, you know, the whole package. And they stood before it. And now... Uh, in the next few verses, we see what, the, what begins the problem. Verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. So it's a command, and it applies to nations and people of every language. That would include the young Jewish people. Verse 5. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So he set up this massive monument type thing. And there's going to be a huge commotion. Everyone's going to hear. I mean, the, the sound of the band there was uh, uh, horns and flutes and zithers and lyres and harps and pipes and all kind of uh, zithers, kind of an early box string guitar thing, which technically they may or may not were using. You know why I say that? Because we weren't there, you know. But some sort of musical instrument and lyres and harps and pipes and all sorts of things. It even adds that all kinds of music. You must fall down and worship the image. Thus saith the government, and the penalty is death. Verse 7. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and the people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now I mentioned this when it came to Daniel and his friends. Well, we talked about last week, for the one person who may remember, a um, little joke there, a little joke there, uh, was that they had been taken away from Jerusalem. They are captives now in a foreign land. They're told to eat the foreign cuisine. It's not of their Jewish standard, their kosher idea, their, you know, their, their idea of what f proper foods are and what proper foods aren't. And even then, they still refuse to eat the king's food. It was amazing because, I mean, they were hauled off. They're a long way off. In fact, my guess is after Babylon besieged the city, it wasn't much fun living there anymore. And here they are in the king's palace learning the language and the history and all these things about Babylon. They're being treated pretty good, looks like. 
I mean, if you had a, you know, hey, by the way, bow down to this thing, you know, well, I don't see too many Jews around. I guess, you know, I mean, you could, you could compromise your uh, faith. You could compromise your personal devotion to God. And Daniel and his friends didn't do that in the last chapter, chapter one. They didn't do that. Uh, and then here we see verse eight. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. And the word astrologers there does not necessarily mean those who studied the stars. But again, along the lines of wise men, you know, learned people, scholars. Verse 9. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. That's just, you know, long live the king kind of a statement. Verse 10. Your majesty has issued a decree, and I realize it gets a little redundant on some of these, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And then they remind them, verse 11, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Just repeating what was just told to us by all the officials and everybody. And then that moment, verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. Your majesty, they never serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Um, and actually, I jumped past it. You, I had those pictures. These are just some, go to the first one. These are just some artist, that's fine, that's fine. These are just some artist ideas of what it might have looked like. To worship. And oddly enough, I want to show, show the other one. This just shows a mass of things. It's kind of a Babylonian looking dude like you'd find on some of the clay tablets or whatever. Uh, this one is a, the statue takes up most of the, the podium is fairly small and the statue takes over. In the other picture, uh, the podium part is much larger. So it could be 90 feet tall, but at the top of the podium, not more than six feet. You know, I don't know. Just, I thought that's what and again, we don't know. But if you've seen that picture there, it looks like they're, hey, you're going to get over there and worship that thing. It's time. The bell's ringing. You know, it's time to go. So he's just found out now that these Jewish men he's been training and they're learning and they're smart and they're bright and they're healthy are not listening to a word he said. Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Verse 14. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. And in verse 15, just for the point of being redundant. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lark, the harp, the pipe, the kind of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. So he gets another chance. Remember, he likes them. They get another chance. Next time you hear the, the music play, get out there and do your worshiping. Um, if you're ready, fall down and worship the image of God. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will, uh, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You know, you're not following my God. You're not worshiping my God. I'm going to put you in a place where your God's not going to help you. You're going to be burnt alive. There's lots of ways to go. That's not a good one. So what is the reply now? I mean, they hadn't, they hadn't capitulated before, but now literally their feet are being put to the fire. You know, or figuratively. Uh, literally. Uh, what are they going to do? And again, my, I said that my chances are you had, a, you, had a, you had some room to compromise. What you knew, your, Israel, your faith in Israel, the temple, all those things that made your religion long gone. And they're actually hanging out in the palace. My guess is there's not a whole lot of Jews besides them and some others. And I mentioned that he took men from other countries also. Do you compromise? Do you, do you change your ways? Do you look the other way? Do you? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Verse 17. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace... The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from it and from your majesty's hand. Well, now, there is a statement of faith. The God we serve is able to deliver us. I mean, he is physically, 
You know, he has the power. He can do that. And he also says, and he will deliver us. There's a bit of faith that it's going to happen. And from your majesty's hand. Remember, he's got through saying, who's going to save you from my hand? Our God's going to save us from your hand. And I've seen lots of people make bold statements of faith. But what I kind of like is that verse plus the next verse. Verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship your image of gold you have set up. You know what that is? That's true faith. That's true faith. If everything goes the way I want it to go and I think it should go, God is to be a, God is good. God is holy. God is to be worshipped. God is to be praised. And even if it doesn't go the way I think it should, God is holy. God is true. God is worthy to be praised. That is true faith. I brought this up a while back when we were in Colossians because the Apostle Paul said something on the lines of, I hope to see you soon, talking to the Colossians. He hopes to visit them soon. Um, in this, depending on what churches you've been to or go to, you run across people who don't like when you use anything in the possible. Maybe I'll do this, or I hope to do that, or even if it doesn't happen, somebody will say, that's a negative confession. You need to stop. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it's happened quite a few times during the course of my life. That if somehow you say anything to the negative, you're automatically cursing yourself from any benefit God would have given you. Not only do I think God can save, I think he can save and do whatever he wants to regardless of what I say. He's that big. He is that big. So if I say, boy, I hope I get better soon over this cold, uh, I mean cold, not like corona. So. Uh, I hope I get you know, healthier soon. Somebody would say, you need to claim that, brother. You need to claim that victory. You know, you need to, well, the apostle Paul doesn't have a problem saying, I hope to see you. Because he also realizes it may not happen. God may have other plans. And they're saying, we will be delivered and he can do it. But even if he doesn't, I'm not worshiping your false God. Even if he doesn't. That. There are those throughout the course of time that stood before the flames and the executioner's sword and the guillotine and whatever else and said, whatever happens. Right? Uh, I think it was Polycarp, which of course sounds like a plastic fish, but it's actually an early church father. It's an early church father. His name was Polycarp. And the story goes, he actually lived and was like a disciple of John. He actually was right at the next generation, right after the, the Gospel of John writer. And it, the story goes, he was a church father and went around doing all stuff. He was, I forget how old he was, he was like 80, 90, 90 maybe. They came, we're going to throw him, burn him at a stake, something like that, you know. I mean, and all he has to do is recant. And I think somewhere along the way, the story goes, a soldier says, those flames will be hot, old man. His final words, not as hot as the flames you'll face. Standing there, you know, faith in God to the last final moment. There are Christians who die well. And that could be rounds of chemo, which would destroy anybody's faith, you know, in many senses, bring your spirits down. And yet, they know that God is God. And even if, we sing a song, even if, uh, maybe we should do that soon. Even if, true faith. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He had, he, his attitude towards them changed. Because remember, he was trying to give them an out. Hey, next time it happens, you guys just catch up with us. We'll be okay. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, that's another one where someone's going to say, there's no way you could heat the clay in an area like that with the particular things that are seven times more than, you know. Uh, I don't think someone whipped out a thermometer, a digital thermometer, and checked the temperature. I'm sure the, court, the king might have said seven times hotter, and I'm sure his servants did everything in their power to make it seven times hotter. And verse 20, he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his armies to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Verse 21. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. <laughs> uh, 
Verse 22, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <clears throat> and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing fire. <clears throat> the guys rushed them up to the mouth of the furnace and it was, the heat was so intense it killed them as the Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego fell into the furnace. I was watching... Uh, What's that show, Dirty Jobs, that one feller? Goes around doing all the lesser desired jobs. What's his name? Oh, 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 that was good, that was good, I heard that. Anyway, redo the crickets, redo the crickets, forget the crickets. He was working at some sort of steel mill, factory steel mill, and the guy's got him up there, and he's got that metal pole, and he's jabbing the molten steel or whatever it is, you know, as it's pouring out of the furnace. And he got a little too close, because when he pulled back, even though he's wearing all the proper gear, the heat shield was melted and rippled on his face. That's how hot that furnace was. And if you get too close, you could get burnt. <clears throat> so here, the guys, these burly, it says they were burly strong men, had tied them up, they ran up there. Uh, in fact, the bigger you are, you could probably throw them from a little distance, but it wasn't good enough. That's how hot the fire was. And they all went in. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. My guess is since he's been knocking off people all day long, even if there wasn't, they would agree. Yes, sir, whatever you said. That's right. Verse 25, well, think about it. He talked about killing Daniel and the, the, the overseer of Daniel and the Jewish men was afraid of dying if they didn't eat the, the food. Here, uh, not only are Meshach, Shadrach dying, the soldiers are dying. Verse 25, he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. So yeah, there's a problem. You know, these guys are thrown in there. They should be, you know, bacon by now. Uh, and... They're walking around in the fire, and there's a fourth guy in there who looks like the son of the gods, King Nebuchadnezzar's word for this fourth person. I mentioned before, a lot of these scenes are considered to be theophanies or Christophanies. That is an appearance of some sort of physical appearance of God or some sort of pre-birth appearance of Christ. Uh, Christ's own testimony, he existed bef before Abraham was, I am, he says. He's, Jesus says he saw Satan fall. So in his own words, he talks about being in existence for eternity. And here, you he very well may be in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. You know, and he brings, I like how it includes servants of the Most High God. You know, yeah, your God's a little bit better than mine. I just, just found that out, you know. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Remember, they had been bound and all the, all the bindings are gone. Uh, the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors, verse 27, crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor the hair on their heads, Sins. The ropes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Now, many people know the smell of fire can, can be, you know, you come back from camping, guess what? You smell like campfire, you know, and your possessions do. And the next time you dig them out of the shed, they still smell like campfire. It is, a, you know, it can cling to you, right? And it actually reminded me, uh, two buildings over the building we rent to the pregnancy center, there was an attempt at arson on the building about three years ago, three and a half years ago, something like that, to where in a, underneath the back little wooden steps to the back door, so farthest from the street, there was all these burnt magazines under these wooden steps, right? All these burnt magazines. And at first they thought, well, maybe somebody's just trying to do a warming fire. Well, that's only going to warm you if you're sitting on the steps, you know? Uh, eventually the fire marshal got involved. He called it arson. He called it arson. So I went through the video cameras, and the one that kind of points over that way, not in the exact spot. 
And I could see the trees flickering every so often, like you'd notice from a campfire. And I actually fast forward to the video. I was going to bring it today, but I forgot where I put it. And it, you can see flashes because it's being fast forwarded. It's actually much slower. But the flashes that I see in those trees reflected go on and off for almost an hour. Almost an hour. As the fire marshal came and I think there was someone from ATF and something else, they're all looking at it. All these magazines in between the pages were matches. So as the pages burnt down, the, the matches would help keep the fire going on these magazines. Well, as they came to inspect it the next day or whatever it was in daylight, they actually pulled the steps away from the building. They were going to use them as evidence because they think they'd caught the guy. There was no fire. There was no smoke. There was no burn marks on the steps. Though the magazines with all the matches had been under there, and I could see the reflection. I'm not saying it was a raging bonfire, but based on the video, it was a fire, and it was going for quite a while to see the reflections of the light in the trees. I actually smelled the wood just to see, right? I couldn't smell anything, right? Well, I'm getting a little older. Not everything's working like it used to. I went and got Stan. I said, come over and smell this. We walked over there, and no smell of smoke whatsoever, and they couldn't take the steps as evidence because... There was no evidence of fire on the steps. Now, you may think I'm reading something in the story. I, I, I don't know if I can convince you one way or the other. But when I looked at the fire and I saw the magazines and I saw the video and everything else, uh, I praise God when I see no fire, no smoke, no signs of burnt wood. And, you know, and again, this not the same as this story, but this story reminds me of that particular event. Verse 28, then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel. He calls him an angel. And of course, remember, as we looked at Moses' story, there was an angel of the Lord in the fiery bush, in the burning bush. He sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god but their own. I mean, he is amazed, and all the facts are before him. So what does he do, the king? Verse 29. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces, and their houses will be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. And sometimes Christians get a little uppity when you talk about their God. And it's for the same reason. Because no other God can save the way he has. In verse 30, the very last verse in the chapter, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. From this situation, they went to a better situation. Much like the story of Joseph, or you know, Daniel's right along in this, and even Jesus, he went from one of the worst possible scenarios, death on a cross, to be highly exalted, sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven. How's that from going from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs? You went from being a, killed like a criminal to the right hand of God the Father. That's impressive. So, as we've looked through these different uh, characters, I called them because some of them were characters. Uh, I, and I mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again. We see Gideon and Moses were horribly reluctant in their faith to follow God. You know, every time God said, you're going to do this, well, wait a minute, you know, what about this? What about that? You know, I'm not so sure I can. Don't talk so good. Maybe you want someone else. You know, it's a timeout for those who aren't sports uh, fans. And I'm not, really. I don't know why I just did that. Anyway, uh, really, I'm, just, I'm not making this stuff up. I have no idea why I did that. Uh, it's just Mike's stuff. Just ignore it. Ignore it. Gideon and Moses are stories of meager impotent faith, and God works with them. So we learn from those two stories that even though our faith can be somewhat lackluster, God is willing to work with us. A beautiful story, a beautiful message to learn from watching these guys fumble and fall. We also looked at King David during a difficult portion of his life with a woman named Bathsheba, and we looked at Cain and Abel over the last little bit. Both those stories involve premeditated murder, 
Both those stories involve that God still worked with the individuals, but there was repercussions. They weren't going to get off scot-free. Their life would be altered greatly by the actions they did that day. Uh, I told you, King David, the, the, the prophet tells him, everything you did in the dark will be done to you in the daylight. And if you read the rest of the story, most of the things that he was doing and hiding and trying to be secret about, his son was doing out loud in his own palace with his own concubines and wives or whatever. So as we move to King David and uh, Cain, it's still kind of helpful, no matter what your sin was, premeditated murder, God's still willing to work with you, though there can be some baggage. And that's true to this day. You could have spent many, many years living your life, partying, carrying on. You could have been attending atheist, I hate God meetings. You could have gone as far as you could. You could have done time. You could have done time. And God is willing to work with you. Pastor friend we met uh, last, last uh, year at a conference, uh, 17 years for murder. And when asked, did you really do it? He said, yes. It was a drive-by shooting. Apparently he was doing the driving. But uh, nonetheless, you go, to, you go to prison for that too. Uh, murderers can find peace and grace in God. So you could too. You, that's a good message. That's a hopeful message. And then as we look at Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're not the reluctant faith. They're the strongest faith we've seen yet. They're not the unbelievable sinners who are supposed to be following God and, and worshiping him. Right? I mean, King David was singing before the Lord at times. King and Abel were offering their offerings, and that's what started the problem. God liked Abel's a little bit better. Right? So here, they have, then you get to Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and there is a strong faith, a true faith, a faith that just keeps going. And then what is the beauty of that? It's about how you live your life. Now, on both those situations, it doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. I mean, let's face it, they've just been hauled off to a foreign country. But things aren't going so bad for them. You know, that's a good, bad news. You've been hauled away. Your, your old city's been half destroyed and the temple's gone. And good news, you're doing okay. Good news, you're doing okay. They stick to the faith. They stick to the guns. And you know what they avoid? the repercussions of sin from their own mistakes. This is a message for young people. This is a message for, in fact, you might be an older person. You got a few years left, make sure they're good years. And you won't have to live with the repercussions of your own sins. This week, since we were here last Sunday, I have seen a man fall off the wagon and become a staggering drunk, losing many years of sobriety. Not once, but twice this week. Twice this week. Will there be repercussions from a life spent chasing alcohol? <laughs> yeah, that, I don't think anyone's going to argue on that one. You know, between work and relationships and health and everything else, finances, anything you want to throw in there, alcohol has a way of affecting all those. Also this week, I was reminded of adultery and the cost thereof, not once, but twice. And how the adultery causes a divorce, the divorce, even if they divorce for the best of reasons, the kids don't always see it that way or feel it that way. In fact, their life goes from having two parents to now having maybe two sets, to living in one house and one school district to maybe one or two or summers here. And their lives are never the same. Right? And I'm not saying you can't get divorced over the case of adultery. You can. It's in the Bible. That's a good one. I'm not saying every reason's good nowadays, but that's, that's a good one. And yet, twice as, and that is that sin that takes place and the repercussions thereof. More than once this week, and I'm not making this up. I am not making this up. Uh, two of them just happened yesterday. Otherwise, I, when I wrote this, I had one written down. And two more happened yesterday. I've heard someone complain about the position of being fatherless not having a dad, not having the same last name as your own father. <clears throat> I looked up online real quick, fatherlessness. Fatherlessness has increased, I forgot what it was, 65% since the 1960s. The biggest reasons they thought were uh, unwed. 
people are just out sowing their seeds and kids are happening by mistake or unplanned and they grow up without dads. And the other one, of course, was a, a divorce. Not every divorce, well, actually, not every divorce. I said that widows are not a matter of sin. You can have a father, you can be single, you can, you can certainly be fatherless because of a, a death in the family of your parent. I'm not picking on everyone. But I think most everyone can agree that all these things I'm talking about aren't just a pebble thrown in a pond. They're all the ripples that happen afterwards. Being, growing up without a dad, growing up with different last names and your half-brothers and half-sisters and everybody asks why. You're reminded of it all the time. Uh, the adultery thing. So learn a lesson from Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Live your life wholly devoted, devoted to the Lord. I'm not saying things will be perfect because their lives weren't perfect. Dan, we haven't got to the part where Daniel has a lion's den problem. That, that comes up a little later. Read it for yourselves. But they didn't have the problem of the repercussions of their own sin. May that be your testimony as you follow God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've read your word. We've seen the repercussions, the outcomes of your holy power, mighty faith, and working with your people. May we be people of faith who follow you. Help us, Lord. Help us from getting sidetracked. Help us from looking the other way. Help us from becoming negligent in our duties to follow you. May our faith be true and vibrant and real. And may we worship you because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for visiting from home. You are dismissed.